The Lord be with you. And with a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory Jesus said to his disciples, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth nations will be in dismay, perplexed by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads, because your redemption is at hand. Beware that your hearts do not become drowsy from carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of daily life, and that day catch you by surprise like a trap. For that day will assault everyone who lives on the face of the earth. Be vigilant at all times, and pray that you have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent, and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Somehow, and for some reason, the day that a priest is ordained, his personal information goes out to the four winds, and you know, I don't know how it happens, but immediately you start getting mail for everything from magazine subscriptions to all kinds of charities asking you for money on a monthly basis or an annual basis, all kinds of religious orders and Newman centers and seminaries and private schools and prayer campaigns they automatically start sending you mail uh, asking for contributions and prayers, of course. They always mention that. And that kind of stuff isn't surprising. There are a lot of people who could use help. Uh, I try to keep my financial contributions to the local level, to my family or my parish or the school that I teach at. But what I wasn't expecting when I got ordained was all of the, th the free books that would come in the mail. Um, every couple of months, you're sent a book to read and the publisher hopes that you will recommend it to your parishioners. And a, a lot of these books are the books that end up being Christmas gifts and Easter gifts. I have a com confession to make. We probably aren't going to get a Christmas book this year uh, because of some complications and errors in communication that were made. But <clears throat> we're still aiming for Easter. That's besides the point. The whole reason I'm talking about this is because for some reason, Certain priests mail other priests self-published books containing their personal homilies. Now, I can't imagine ever being that self-confident, and by self-confident I mean that full of myself, uh, that I would send my homilies to random priests all over the country. And the homilies in these, uh, these self-published books, they're not ever really that good. Uh, but... I have to eat my own words because sometimes I actually go through and read some of these homilies in these books. And they almost never leave an impression on me. Every once in a while they might have, you know, a good church appropriate joke in them or something like that, uh, which is all right, I guess. So I found myself this week paging through one of the random uh, priests that I've never met homily books that are, sit on my library bookshelf. and. The reason I resorted to that is because I dread Advent and Christmas. And by that I mean I dread preaching during Advent and Christmas. For the rest of the church year, you kind of have some, some freedom and flexibility about what you say at Mass. But during Advent and Christmas, you kind of have to stick to Adventy and Christmassy things, right? And you run out of those pretty quick. I've been a priest, this will be my 12th Advent and Christmas. So, there's only so much that you can say about Advent and Christmas, so I found myself looking for fresh ideas, and I resorted to one of these priests that I've never met homily books that I got in the mail. Now, I'm not going to copy and paste his homily wholesale because it really wasn't that good, but uh, I will talk today about a good point that this priest made in this particular book, and uh, his point was this, that we're all tempted to think about Christmas, you know, I know the story. I've heard it a million times. We've heard the Advent and Christmas story before. It's basically the most fundamental thing about our faith, that our Creator became one of us, that He came to this earth, that He was born of a woman into a family, and all of this is familiar, but all of this is important. 
So I've decided this year that I'm going to talk about the things that we all know about. I'm going to talk about the most fundamental aspects, very basic aspects of, of Advent and Christmas. And I'm going to do so because these are things that we need to hear. These are the basics. These are the fundamentals, the fundamental truths of our faith. And while the story of Advent and the story of Christmas has not changed, we, in fact, have changed since last year. Um, you're not the same person that you were this time in 2020. Perhaps you've made new friends or lost some friends. You've been through a whole year worth of stuff, both good and bad. Maybe you've lost a loved one or two. Maybe you've become a new parent. Or maybe you've become a parent for the second, third, fourth, or fifth time. Maybe you had some health challenges. Maybe you feel that the world has changed a lot in the last year. That always seems to be the case, usually not for the better. But my point is, is that while Christmas and Advent, that story hasn't changed since last year, you most likely have. I most likely have. And because of that, this ancient story that forms the bedrock of our faith should be new and fresh to us no matter how many times we've heard it in our lives. So. Let's take a look at the very basics of the Advent and Christmas season, and let's take a, a look back on things that we might have allowed ourselves to just get too familiar with, that we're, we're no longer thinking about those things. Uh, growing up, <clears throat> I loved the different seasons of the church year, Advent, Christmas, Lent, and Easter, and, and all those. They all had different things about them, and we did things differently in church during those seasons. And I remember the Advent wreath in our church, as we went through Advent, we would, of course, light each of the candles each week, and uh, the closer we got to Christmas. And uh, under each of the four candles of the Advent wreath, it was a much bigger Advent wreath than the one that we have, but under each of the four candles was a little banner that hung down from each of the four candles, and each of those four banners had a single word on it. And as I got older, I sort of thought that those banners hanging from the Advent wreath were a little bit, you know, cheesy. Uh, sort of like turning Advent into, you know, one of those signs that people put in their house that says live, laugh, and love, that kind of cheesy. I, I thought that. But um, but then I, I was thinking about that this week, and it turns out that those four words hanging from the Advent wreath, they perfectly summarize Advent, and they perfectly summarize our faith. And so I'm going to make those four words the themes of each week this Advent. And I want us as a parish to take those four words to heart. And it'll be our way of preparing ourselves for Christmas. Because it always seems every year that Advent goes by so quickly that we get to Christmas and we're not really spiritually prepared for it. But this year I'm going to give you some homework each week of Advent. And that homework will be based off of the words on those cheesy banners hanging from my childhood Advent wreath. And the first candle had the word hope attached to it. And if you look at this week's readings, there's a reason why the word hope hung from the first Advent candle. Our first reading comes from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a tragic character. If you know his background. He, he was called to be a prophet during the last days of the kingdom of Israel. And he continually called the people of Israel, specifically Jerusalem, to repentance in the face of the oncoming Babylonian Empire. I actually talked about the Babylonian Empire last week. Um, and it was uh, this Babylonian Empire that would eventually completely crush Jerusalem. They would burn the city to the ground, they would completely destroy it. This, the temple built by King Solomon, and many of God's chosen people were enslaved and deported a thousand miles away to the city of Babylon. And Jeremiah was called to warn the people of Jerusalem of this coming disaster, to call them to repentance. And, well, they, they wouldn't less listen, including the king of, of Jerusalem himself. In fact, Jeremiah was arrested for inciting public uh, discord. 
he was publicly humiliated by being put in the stocks. You know, you see in the old Western movies where your arms and your head are put in a wooden frame and you're kind of forced to stand in the public square and people, people would walk by and spit on him and physically abused him. And so Jeremiah was made a laughing stock. And in those final days, as Babylon was advancing upon Jerusalem, the king of Jerusalem fled south into Egypt, and he took Jeremiah with him. And both of them would die in a foreign land, the land where his ancestors were enslaved by the Egyptians. And so Jeremiah, is a, he's a miserable, uh, sympathetic character. And yet, this is what he has to say in our first reading. He makes a prophecy for Judah, the kingdom of Jerusalem, and he says this. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promises he made to the house of Israel. In those days I shall do what is right and just in the land. In those days Judah shall be safe and Jerusalem shall dwell secure. And Jeremiah is saying these words as the world around him is, is crumbling to pieces. Do these words from our first reading, do they sound like the words of someone who is being persecuted? Someone who is being wrongfully imprisoned and mocked and abused? Do they sound like the words of somebody who is witnessing his homeland being completely torn apart by foreigners? At first we would like to say, well, this is really strange coming out of this guy's mouth who's witnessing all these things. But to me, these words sound like a person who has hope. Hope is what allows us to see God <clears throat> when everything around you is falling apart. And it's the same in our gospel. Once again, Jesus is talking about all the terrible things that will happen at the end of the world. And he says that there will be people who will be in dismay. But he tells us instead of cowering in fear, we ought to have hope. And so here is our homework this week as a parish. Our homework to help us get back to basics our homework to be prepared ourselves for Christmas, to prevent Christmas from sneaking up on us, to do this one thing this week. It's simple, but oftentimes the simplest things are the most difficult. In this week, this Advent, look at things with hope. There's so much to be hopeless about. The state of the world, politics, the loved ones that we've lost, family problems, the Nebraska football team, <laughs> arguments about a stupid virus. I'm not asking you to put all of that out of your mind and all that aside. I'm asking you to view those things with the perspective of hope because that belongs to us Christians. The same hope that Jeremiah had. Hope not in earthly things, but in heavenly things. Put your hope not in politicians, or even your family or your friends, put hope only in God. And throughout the course of this week, find time each day, maybe before you go to bed, or maybe when you're on a walk, or at your desk, when you're out checking cows, or when you're behind the wheel, find that time to frame the entire world around you in hope. And when you do that, you'll be prepared, as Jesus says in our Gospel. December 25th will not catch you off guard. When you frame the world around you from the perspective of hope, you'll find the true and most basic meaning of Christmas, that God came to this earth just for you, that God came to this earth to give us hope in a world that seems so often to be hopeless.